let's move into another type of pre-processing that's common with remote sensing, and that is data compression, or really manipulating uh, the number and nature of bands that we have within our imagery. This is particularly common when we are trying to cover extremely large areas or when we have uh, imagery with a lot of bands, like hyperspectral imagery. Um, and the idea is that these files are huge. That if there's any way that we can reduce the size of those files while retaining all the information that we need, we should do that as a pre-processing step. We try to find ways to uh, manipulate or transform the bands that we have into a smaller number of layers that still contain all of the important information that we're going to need for our analyses and essentially just try to discard the noise, right? the information that is not useful to our efforts. Um, and there are a couple different ways that we can do this. One that we've already tried in our previous labs is a tasseled cap transformation. So a tasseled cap was developed specifically to pull out information pertinent to vegetation classification or vegetation condition studies. And so they take all of the common multispectral bands that we have and it adjusts them so that it can pull out information specifically to how bright each pixel is, how green each pixel is, and how wet each pixel is. So it's not just a random transformation. It's literally saying we want to take all of our original multispectral bands and transform them um, into three bands that are going to give us some very specific information. So if you wanted to look at how this transforms things, here is our uh, typical false color image where we have um, the NIR band applied to the red gun, so these very high NIR reflectance vegetation areas are going to show up as very red. Um, water has very high absorption, so that's going to be very dark. And then everything else is some funky turquoise color. But when we apply that tasseled cap, we use those three bands, and if we apply red to the brightness or the first band, green to the greenness, the second tasseled cap band, and blue to the wetness, um, you begin to see not just that these are different, but really you can distinguish how they are different. So the sandbar becomes very easily distinguishable from the vegetation, which is very different from the water. Um, different types of vegetation become more easily distinguished the road becomes more easily distinguished from the buildings. So tasseled cap really can be useful in taking a multispectral image and really breaking that down so that you can get more detailed information specific to classifying different terrestrial surface features. Another really common transformation that takes the original image with all of its multispectral bands and converts it to a smaller number of bands that contain the same information is the principal components analysis. This is a little bit harder to understand theoretically because it works in n-dimensional space, which our human brain has a very hard time um, imagining. But essentially, think of it this way the software is able to plot out in, say I had four bands, so it plots out in four-dimensional space every single pixel and where it falls in that four-dimensional space. And the original bands, those are the original axes, so band one would be the x-axis and band two would be the y-axis and band three would be the z-axis and band four would be the, I don't know, what whatever you want to call the next fourth dimensional axis. And it then rotates those axes until those axes fall at the locations where the pixels are most easily differentiated from each other. right? Or in other words, where the pixels are most obviously different or able to be classified differentially. This gives us new bands that are in a completely new coordinate system. So when the principal components analysis gives us our however many bands, we can pick how many bands we want the PCA to give us. Um, but essentially it's taking those bands and each of those is actually some combination of the original band. One of the other nice things is that those new bands are orthogonal, meaning they're at 90 degrees from each other, so they're statistically independent. They're not correlated with each other. And the whole goal of the principal components analysis is to be able to still account for all of the spectral differences between all of the pixels, eliminating any of those that don't contribute to the variability between pixels. The principal components analysis is trying to take our 
our original bands and rotate those. So here were our original bands and rotate these to new principal component axes right, or, or new principal components bands that account for all of that same variability among our pixels. Now what's really nice about the principal components analysis is that the first principal component bands that are created are the ones that account for most of the variability in the image. So these are going to be the ones that contain most of the information that we want to conduct our analyses. And then the later principal components bands are typically where all the noise gets lumped. And so you can just choose to use say the first three or the first four bands of your principal components analysis taking that same false color image that we had before, if we look at what the principal con components transform looks like, you can see that this becomes really nice in distinguishing particularly between um, those man-made surface features. The road looks much different from the buildings, which in the original false color uh, it didn't so much. And we're still able to pick up differences in the sort of non-vegetated land from the water. Um, we can even see some differences in roof structures. So it's really worked pretty well uh, to pull out some of that variability uh, from that original multi-band image. So remember these three bands now contain information from all of the bands that were collected by this quick bird sensor. So principal component transformations make pretty maps, pretty coverages, but we still have to be able to interpret those because we first of all have to know well how much of the variability in our original image using all of the bands are we able to account for using this smaller number of PCA bands and we can get that from something called the eigenvalues so when we do a principal components transform there'll be a new file created that is an eigenvalue file and this will tell us how much of the total spectral variability is now contained in that one band and we can use these eigenvalues to figure out how many bands we have to retain for our analyses because we would still like to get close to capturing 100% of the total variability in our image. Um, and usually we'll want to use as many PCA bands as it takes to get to at least 95% of that information or of that variability. The eigenvectors, on the other hand, are used to help us interpret which of the original image bands are contributing to the loadings for each of those new principal components bands. Right? So in other words, when those axes were rotated in the principal components transformation, okay, some of the original bands had a higher weighting or were more cl were closer to those new um, rotated principal components axes. And so we can use the eigenvectors to figure out which bands are contributing the most information to each of our principal components bands. So in combination, the eigenvalues telling us how much variability is being uh, accounted for in each PCA band and the eigenvectors which tell us where that information is coming from help us to interpret this principal components analysis. I'll give you an example of what this output looks like um, from a principal components analysis in Imagine. If you were to open the output eigenvalue file, you would just be given a list of numbers. And each of these numbers refers to each of the principal components bands. So this would be principal components 1, principal components band 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. But the way that you can figure out how much variability is being accounted for by each of these bands is by basically figuring out what proportion of the total variability um, each band is. So if I took each of these bands, I now have it in Excel, and I calculated a total. Well, if I take this right, and I divide it by the total, that is basically the proportion of variance that's accounted for by that first band. I can do the same thing for the second PCA band and that gives me the proportion of variability that's accounted for by band 2. So if I were to look at this cumulatively I can see that just in the first two principal components bands I've got almost 99 or over 99 percent of the total variability, spectral variability in this image already accounted for by just these two bands. By the time I get down to the third band I have less than 1 percent. So if I were to use this for my analysis I may only need two bands to account for all of the variability in my image.
the output file from the PCA for the eigenvectors, remember this is how much each of the original bands contributes to each of the new PCA transformed bands. That looks a little bit more messy because it has to be a matrix, right? We have to have each of the original bands in the image and imagine the more bands you have, the larger this table will be. And also each of the PCA transformed bands. And so what this is telling you is that for that first PCA band, band 1, the original band 1 contributed 0.05. Now these are sort of unitless values. They're really just used to be um, to identify how much information they contribute relative to each other. Now don't worry about the sign. It's the absolute value that matters. That's telling us essentially how strong, either in a positive or a negative direction, it's adjusting um, those axes for this new orthogonal fit. So we're up to 0.54 um, for that first band in PCA3 and what we're seeing is that it really isn't until we get out to that fourth principal components band that band one is really contributing the most information and if we think about what we know about atmospheric um, interference this makes sense because we know that those shorter wavelengths like those blue bands in band one this is quick bird imagery um, scatter the most and so it makes sense that as we talked about the first PCA bands being the ones that really pull out um, the information relative to our surface features and then these later PCA bands are where the noise seems to be um, compressed. You can see that it is this first band that is primarily contributing to the fourth principal components analysis and from our eigenvectors we know that it wasn't very much, right? So it was really less than 0.1 percent that was coming from noise due to this atmospheric interference. Right, let's look at PCA1. So for that first principal components band then where is most of the variability in the pixels coming from and we can see that it's really band 4 that has that highest eigenvector again think absolute value so band 4 is the one that's contributing the most to this first principal components band so therefore really principal components band 1 is an approximation of our near infrared band um, print, once we get into principal component band 2, so which band then was the second, uh, which original band was the second most important in this, uh, this accounting for all the variability in our image, and it turns out that it is band 2, although band 3 is not far behind it, right? So you can see that both the original bands 2 and band 3 are almost equally weighted in these eigenvectors. So it's kind of interesting, it helps you really understand um, how the original spectra are contributing to the variability in the image, but then lets you use these principal components uh, bands instead for a more efficient classification or analysis of your data. So just a word of warning, um, when you do open these output files within the software, they're typically just a space delimited text file with a whole lot of significant figures. Um, so you're going to get a bazillion decimal places. They may be hard to read, which is why I typically will open these in Excel um, so that they'll be parsed out into separate uh, rows and columns, making them a little bit easier to interpret. So in addition to reducing how many bands we have to use for our later analysis, there are other benefits of this principal components transform. Um, and one of them is that it eliminates that correlation between our bands. So there are many statistical techniques that we might want to use later, particularly in our biophysical modeling. But if we run a principal components analysis, there's no longer going to be correlation between bands 1 and 2, which is actually very common, usually in the original imagery, if band 1 is high, it's likely that band 2 is also going to be high. And if band 1 is low, it's likely that band 2 will be low. This is just a straight statistical correlation, and it means that those two bands are not independent. And so it limits um, some of the statistical modeling that we can do with the spectrum. When we run a PCA, we've essentially reorganized um, where those axes are, and because they're orthogonal, they're now independent. Um, the other thing is that it actually can uh, remove some of these other sources of noise. It can often pull out the atmospheric interference in those later principal components bands, but it also has been shown to reduce some of this bad banding and striping because often what will happen is if the PCA picks up that pattern like you would see in striping, um, it will uh, it'll 
put that variability into one of the PCA bands. And so if you remove that and don't use that band in your analysis, you've effectively eliminated the striping. So it's another uh, really nice technique for eliminating some of those radiometric errors.